Okay, rolling. So you can see that the airfoil shape, what? Yeah, that's probably not a good idea. All right, we'll just redo it. All right. Um, so you can see that the airfoil shape is what? All right, just restart it. We're fine. What's up, MCS Mahone here, bringing you another fact-filled fun video about rotorcraft. This video is about helicopter aerodynamics, and just a heads up, this video is going to suck. Unfortunately, there is nothing we can do to make the subject of aerodynamics any less dry than it is. We will, however, water it down so that you won't have to deal with the hardest part of it. Buckle up though, as these concepts are definitely some of the most difficult we are going to cover on this channel. But realize that complete understanding is not at all necessary to continue watching this channel. If that sounds intimidating, don't worry, we won't be covering any math, and we're only gonna cover these topics at a very conceptual level. We're only covering these topics here as they may come up from time to time in future videos. So, let's begin. As we said in episode one, each helicopter rotor blade is a tiny wing. But what does that mean exactly? A wing is a wing because of the shape of its profile, which we call an airfoil shape. But why do we use this shape? Because this shape allows us to generate lift efficiently. And by efficiently, we mean create lift without creating a lot of drag. First, let's define these terms. Lift is the force that pushes the wing upward. Drag is the force that pushes it backwards. We could use just about any shape of rotor blades and generate lift, but it would also create a lot of drag, and that would take too much engine power for us to get off the ground. Here's how the air flows around something that creates a lot of drag, and here's the air flow around something more slippery. By the way, the lines in these diagrams represent the movement of air and are called streamlines. Designing something for low drag is often called streamlining. How does an airfoil generate lift efficiently? It's called Bernoulli's principle. It works because air flows over the top of the wing faster than it flows under the bottom, and the air on the top exerts a lower pressure than the air on the bottom. Subtracting one from the other it results in a net upward pressure, which we call lift. You can see in the diagram, some of the lift contributes to drag as well. Wings are shaped in such a way to create the most lift with the least drag. The best shapes are discovered with wind tunnel testing. You can see some here. Let's define some terms related to wings. The part of the wing that hits the air first is called the leading edge, and the opposite side is called the trailing edge. The distance between them is the cord line. Oh, the cord line? No, it's actually C-H-O-R-D. Oh, the cord line? Sure, yeah. Upper and lower surfaces are called the upper and lower cambers and the amount of camber is the distance between the point of max camber and the cord line. Don't worry if that seems like a lot of terms. It could take a while to memorize all those, but we need to know what the cord line is because it defines two critical angles that are important knowledge for pilots. First, let's talk about the blade pitch angle. This is the physical angle between the cord line of the main rotor blades and the plane of the rotor disc, shown here as the angle of incidence. This is initially set when the rotor blades are mounted to the helicopter, and it typically decreases as you move outboard from the rotor blade toward the blade tip. You can see that in this illustration here. This change in the pitch angle is called the blade twist, and it means that the pitch of the blade inboard near the rotor mast is greater than outboard towards the blade tip. Twist in helicopter blades is an attempt to balance the lift over the entire span of the blade. As the air is traveling faster in the outboard portions of the rotor blade than it is in the inboard portions. You can see that in this illustration here. Airplane wings generally incorporate twist too, but for a different reason that's beyond the scope of this video. On airplanes, the pitch angle is called the angle of incidence, and conventional airplanes generally cannot change this angle. Although the pilot can't control the twist or the blade bending, the pilot does have control over the pitch angle. Helicopter pilots can vary the pitch angle using the helicopter controls. 
Here you see the blade pitch being increased by pulling up on the collective control. We're going to cover helicopter controls in another video, so for now, let's just stick to the angles. The second angle pilots need to know is the angle of attack. This is the angle between the relative wind hitting the rotor blade and the blade cord line. The relative wind is the angle at which the air is striking the airfoil, and it's a combination of the movement of the spinning rotor blades, the movement of the helicopter itself, and the actual wind. Increasing the angle of attack increases the lift that the wing produces. But if this angle gets too great, a stall will occur. A stall is when the smooth airflow over the top of the wing detaches from the airfoil, and it occurs anytime the angle of attack exceeds the critical angle of attack for the airfoil. When a stall occurs, the airflow looks like this, and the wing no longer produces lift. It's important to understand the difference between pitch and angle of attack, but it can take some time to wrap your head around this concept. Do you really need to know the difference between pitch and angle of attack as a casual enthusiast? No, not really. But helicopter pilots do. So once again, the pitch is a mechanical angle set by the pilot flight control. The angle of attack is an aerodynamic angle set by the direction of the wind hitting the rotor blades. One final time, the pitch is a mechanical angle, the angle of attack is an aerodynamic angle. You can see the difference in this illustration. Take a second to locate the pitch angle and the angle of attack so you can see the difference. These two angles are only generally the same if the helicopter is not moving and the rotor blades are not moving air down through the rotor system. So generally speaking, these two angles are only the same if the helicopter is idling on the ground in zero wind. Obviously, they are related though. Increasing the pitch angle generally increases the angle of attack. For example, this is why to take off, a pilot pulls up on the collective control, which increases the rotor blade pitch. Increasing the pitch increases the angle of attack and increasing the angle of attack increases the lift that the rotor blades are producing. At some point, the lift exceeds the weight of the helicopter, and away you go. Just like airplane wings, rotor blades can stall. If the rotor blades aren't traveling fast enough through the air, they stall. In a helicopter, we call this low rotor RPM stall, and it can generally be avoided anytime the engine is able to produce the power required to move the rotor blades through the air and therefore maintain the rotor RPM. The proper rotor RPM is indicated by the green arc on this gauge. We'll talk more about this gauge in future videos. It's the job of the pilot to ensure that the helicopter is never put in a position where the engine can't do its job. This means ensuring the helicopter is light enough to take off and perform the mission. Rotor blades can also stall when the helicopter is traveling very fast. This type of stall is unique to helicopters and is called retreating blade stall. When the helicopter is in forward flight, the blade that is moving backwards or retreating is experiencing a slower flow of air than the blade that is moving forward or advancing. This condition is known as dissymmetry of lift. And as we'll see in the next video, blades flap to compensate. The retreating blade flaps down in order to compensate for this dissymmetry of lift, but at some point the retreating blade stalls. Let's just talk briefly about the rotor blades. Like all wings, they have a span, which is half the diameter of the rotor disc. The ratio of the wing span to the cord length is called the aspect ratio. Higher aspect ratio wings think long and thin, produce lift more efficiently with less drag. Like airplane wings, rotor blades have a structural component that runs spanwise, that is, along the length of the blade, called the spar. Here's a fiberglass airfoil I made back in engineering school. The craftsmanship is a good example of why engineers should never get their hands dirty. You can see the upper and lower spars on the top and bottom of the airfoil. In this case, there are just multiple layers of uni and bi-directional fiberglass that have been folded and cut and then epoxied into place. In a metal wing, the spar is typically an I-beam or C-channel or box channel. Sometimes the spar is pressurized with an inert gas so that any cracks in the spar can be easily detected by a loss of pressure. The spar is located at the one-quarter cord position. Why this position? Because that's the location of the center of pressure which is where the lifting force acts through. In future videos will talk about why that is, but for right now, just take my word for it. The spar is a structural component that's designed to hold three times the aircraft weight. So why does the spar need to hold three times the aircraft weight? When you bank an aircraft, any aircraft, even airplanes, in a level turn or pull up from a dive, the load factor increases. Not only are you holding the weight of the aircraft, but you're also holding the inertia of the aircraft that's trying to move it away from the turn. 
This is what's meant by pulling G's. Normal category aircraft must be able to remain intact even when the pilot pulls G's in a tight turn or pulls up from a dive. Utility and aerobatic category aircraft need to be able to remain intact with much higher G loads, maybe as high as 20 G's, which is more than the human occupants can withstand for more than just a few seconds. Woo, that was a lot. Please don't be scared away. We're gonna cover these topics in more detail in other videos, and complete understanding is by no means necessary at this stage. Next week, we're gonna talk about helicopter rotor systems. If you want to learn more about helicopters, be sure to hit that subscribe. Here's the equation for the conservation of mass when applied to our control body. <laughs> what is that? What is that? Oh, we're just talking about the math behind aerodynamics. Well, anyway, I gotta go. Wait, where are you going? I got a date with destiny. Later, loser. God, that guy's such a jerk.